OK, good. So thank you very much to Ro uh, Robin and to Mercatus for inviting me to give this talk. And to be frank, I'm more interested in questions you have about the Privileges and Immunity Clause. Uh, I'm, uh, it's, you all work for people who have a substantial opportunity to use this clause. But I, uh, Robin has asked me to make sure that, uh, to, uh, to, I guess, to backfill a lot of basics about what the Privileges or Immunities Clause might mean. And then in the second hour, Joyce Malcolm will talk more about what uh, Justice Thomas's concurring opinion in a recent Supreme Court case says about the clause and what his concurring opinion could suggest going forward. So let me, uh, I'm going to jump to the end to kind of to, to set up why I'm going to go through the background of the Privileges or Immunities Clause. In his concurring opinion in the McDonald versus the City of Chicago case, Justice Thomas states, I believe that the original meaning of the 14th Amendment offers a superior alternative to substantive due process, and to uh, return to that meaning would allow this court to enforce the rights the 14th Amendment is designed to protect with greater clarity and predictability. So a little bit of background. In contemporary constitutional law, the clause in the 14th Amendment that does the most work to restrain actions by states is the Due Process Clause, and a close second is the Equal Protection Clause. One branch of, of, of due process law is the law of substantive due process. And substantive due process, at a very high level of generality, holds that when a state is restrained from denying life, liberty, or pro property without due process of law, part of due process of law it states a restraint that the state action not be arbitrary or unreasonable in light of some fundamental norms. That requirement is called substantive due process. There are many debates about whether substantive due process is legitimate or illegitimate as a contradiction in terms. And, however, some of that debate could, is, is more academic than practical because it could be that many of the, the constitutional doctrines now associated with substantive due process are in fact covered by the Privileges or Immunities Clause. And in his concurring opinion in McDonald, Justice Thomas is stating he is skeptical about substantive due process. He's therefore skeptical of a lot of case law going back, I'd say, about 130 years. But he thinks that much of that case law might be replaceable. The, the, it might be right results just that happen to be on the wrong textual foundations. On the other hand, it could be that some parts of substantive due process doctrine do not reach far enough to cover all the things that the Privileges or Immunities Clause also covers. So he's also raised some issues uh, about, uh, for new areas of constitutional litigation or dispute. So when Justice Thomas embraces a reading of the 14th Amendment Privileges or Immunities Clause, he posits a choice between, t broadly speaking, two approaches. One approach he calls the an anti-discrimination approach. And he uh, Justice Thomas rejects the anti-discrimination approach. On the other hand, he, conduct, he analyzes a broad range of historical materials about the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And he, looking at those historical materials, he concludes that the, the material suggests that the right to bear arms is declared in the Second Amendment to, uh, to the Constitution in the Bill of Rights. Was it, uh, it, the Second Amendment declares a right that privileges and immunities also declares and covers. So he concludes that the, uh, the Privileges or Immunities Clause establishes a minimum baseline of federal rights, and the constitutional right to keep and bear arms plainly was among them. I'll talk more about this towards the end of my segment, but he creates this dichotomy or this choice between an anti-discrimination view and a view where the 14th Amendment incorporates or draws on or repeats what is already in the Second Amendment. So Justice Thomas's concurrence raises a few questions. 
One is, is, the right to, is he right to conclude that the right to bear arms is a privilege or immunity? Another is, what's the anti-discrimination reading of the privileges or immunities clause? And if, assuming that the anti-discrimination reading is wrong, how does one determine whether other rights count as the kinds of privileges or immunities that Justice Thomas talked about in applica application to the right to bear arms? And last, let's, we don't need to assume that Justice Thomas's reading of the privileges or immunities clause is right. He might be wrong. And I'm not going to answer all these questions. What I want to do in my hour is to say, set up a lot of the, I want to go walk through the text of the Constitution. I think this is my next slide. Yeah, I want to go through the text of the 14th Amendment. And I want to canvas three dominant approaches in case law and scholarly commentary that are the most likely interpretations or, or constructions of the text. And assuming that one or the other of those constructions is the right construction, spell out what the implications would, would be. And I hope if I give that background, I then set up more pre precisely for Professor Malcolm the Justice Thomas's attempt to apply the text of the 14th Amendment and other relevant material to figure out whether the right to bear arms is a privilege or immunity and, and what it means to abridge such a privilege or immunity. So, I, as Justice Thomas does, I'm going to start with the text and work towards more complicated possibilities not obvious in the text. The text of the Privileges or Immunities Clause states, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. So far, so good. Now, Justice just, just Thomas's opinion is significant because the opinion is pushing back against a case holding that is now a hundred and I'm going to, uh, 127, 137 years old. The Slaughterhouse Cases from 1873. The slaughter, in the Slaughterhouse Cases, a, a, uh, a butcher in the, in the parish that holds New Orleans complained that the uh, state authorities had granted an exclusive monopoly over the butchering trade to another butcher. And he said that the right to practice the trade of butchering was a privilege or immunity, and the monopoly law abridged it. In the slaughterhouse cases, the US Supreme Court r construed the Privileges and Immunities Clause very narrowly. And it did so, uh, to, so that the clause only applies to a few rights closely associated with national citizens. For example, the right to t travel to DC to make a list of, present a list of grievances to one's congressman. But the Bill of Rights, on the other hand, the uh, court held is none of those protections as against the states are privileges or immunities in the 14th Amendment because the privileges or immunities clause could not have been construed to repeat what was already in the Bill of Rights. As a result of the slaughterhouse cases and a few others like them around the same, decided about the same time, the privileges or immunities clause is used very rarely now in contemporary litigation. The last significant decision by the U.S. Supreme Court you, in which the case was held to have some vitality was Sense versus Roe from 1999. In Sense, a, a litigant traveled from one state to another state and applied for welfare benefits in the new state of residence. A state residency required, the state welfare laws made someone ineligible for welfare unless the applicant had resided for a minimum number of days, and the litigant said that the residency requirement abridged a privilege or immunity of, of citizenship by abridging her right to travel from one state to another without suffering disabilities. And the court bought that theory. But that case is much more the exception than the rule. Most of the, for most topics, the Privileges or Immunities Clause has very little coverage. So assuming that Justice Thomas wants to ask first questions about the Privileges or Immunities Clause, let's start with first pieces of information about its text. The first point about the Privileges or Immunities Clause is that it restrains the actions of states. Again, the text states, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge or, uh, the privileges or immunities of citizens of, this, of the United States. That fact makes the privileges or immunities clause like 
other constitutional limitations on states, for instance, in Article I, Section 10 of the Constitution. But it also makes the Privileges or Immunities Clause quite different from the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment in the Bill of Rights starts off saying Congress shall make no law, and then it, 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 the, the, the amendment enumerates a series of uh, protections of individual liberty, of, of religious free exercise, uh, the right to be free from, state, or from, from a congressional establishment of religion, and then there's a right to petition and a, a, a right of free speech uh, and a right of free press. So that amendment, by its terms, is understood to apply only to Congress. Other amendments in the Bill of Rights are also, do not use the phrase, Congress shall make no law, but since those amendments were added as limitations to a constitution creating a new federal government, it was held pretty quickly in the uh, U.S. Supreme Court's case law that the Bill of Rights is meant as a limitation to apply only to acts of the federal government. Barron versus Baltimore. Now, the, by contrast, because the, the, uh, the, the 14th Amendment uh, Privileges or Immunity Clause starts off, no state shall, it's a, it's a limitation on the action of states. And if it, if, in addition, I should point out, the 14th Amendment taken as a whole vests in Congress, in Section 5, power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. So. The 14th Amendment limits, it declares that certain actions by states are off limits. Expressly, Congress gets power to enforce the 14th Amendment and the restraints it puts on states. So, I guess a couple of questions. One I've listed here, it could be that actions by the Congress protecting, uh, the, the, uh, protecting individual rights against state abridgments could be, in doctrinal terms, political questions, doc or questions that are off limits to the courts. So, uh, there's some questions that are a mixture of law and politics, and the politics in these questions are, dominate so much that courts say, we just don't want to get it, you take one step into this area. A classic example of this would be the, uh, the guarantee clause. Uh, Article 4 of the Constitution guarantees that every state uh, preserve a Republican form of government. The Supreme Court has held that when, when uh, for instance, if uh, there's a bitter dispute in a state that comes close to being a civil war and federal authorities intervene to declare one faction the official government, the other an illegitimate government, political question. Now, if the, on the other hand, it could also be that the 14th Amendment states it declares rights and the rights can be ascertained by courts and courts could use the 14th Amendment as a source for jurisdiction, federal question jurisdiction to protect individual rights against state actions. Next important point about the Privileges or Immunities Clause, the verbs, uh, no state shall make or enforce any law. Strictly as a matter of text, not case law, but strictly as a matter of text, the 14th Amendment Privileges or Immunity Clause seems to point towards the parts of state lawmaking that make, or the parts of state government that make laws. And the other two main clauses in the 14th Amendment, Section 1, focus more on the application of law. The Equal Protection Clause, nor shall any portion be denied equal protection of law. To say that protection of law is to say there already exists a baseline of law and some state official is applying that law to protect an individual's rights. So the Equal Protection Clause, strictly as a matter of text, is, uh, applies, to, it, it, uh, applies to say the, the actions of a sheriff to decide whether or not to, to enforce a, batter, a criminal battery law in a particular case. Or the, the determinations by a judge whether that battery law applies on the facts. Same thing uh, with the Due Process Clause, nor shall uh, a pro life, liberty, nor property be, be denied without due process of law. Due process of law, I think in its primary meaning, talks, presumes a baseline of procedural and legal regularity. There already exists law, and a state violates the, the law by, by not applying law that ought to apply in a particular case. By contrast, make or enforce any law focuses on the choices by state legislatures when they make law. Next, back to the text here for a minute. Nor shall any, uh, nor, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge, 
the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. There's an ambiguity here, too. In short, privileges or immunities could mean one thing, and citizens could refer to a group of people. But separately, citizens of citizens of the United States might be an adjective modifying privileges or immunities and telling you something about what kinds of privileges or immunities are covered. So uh, the more likely construction, or the, the less likely construction, is that privileges or immunities of citizens of these the several states ought to be read as one entire whole, and so that of citizens of the United States, state ref modifies privileges or immunities so that privilege or immunities talks about a certain class of rights. So in this sense, the, pr it would be, the privileges or immunities would be privileges or, or immunities associated with being a citizen of the United States as opposed to other privileges or immunities that might adhere, say, in state citizenship or in local state law like state incorporation law. It could be that privileges, of, privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States refers to some distinctly federal rights separate from the privilege you get when you incorporate a company. But I think the better reading is that privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States means the citizens of the United States have a set of privileges or immunities which may not be abridged. And I provide a site here to the article that goes through the text and the relevant background history to tee that up. I'm just going to assume that point here. I can take questions on it if people are curious. So that then means, if then, states, they can't make certain kinds of laws. And they can't make laws uh, that that's touch on certain privileges or immunities. And we know all citizens of the United States have those. But we don't yet know what those privileges or immunities are. And in the rest of my time, I want to toss out and explain in a little bit of detail the three constructions of privilege or immunities that have had the most traction in different parts of case law that's speculating what the, this clause would look like if the slaughterhouse cases were ever overruled. And probably more fairly to say, uh, it, it's been speculated about by academics like myself and Professor Malcolm because we are paid to imagine what would be, the law would look like if uh, the case law didn't exist. So the three views are the anti-discrimination view, the incorporation view, and the fundamental rights view. Uh, in the slides I prepared for Mercatus a month ago, I called this view, the, the third view, the, the natural rights view. I'll explain why I made the switch, but the two are more or less interchangeable. So let, let me, I'll go through them in this order. So the first view, uh, the anti-discrimination view. According to the anti-discrimination view, the Privilege or Immunities Clause lets states structure their criminal law and private law largely however they like. As long, but th there's one important side, side constraint. The laws and state officers must protect, protect the same rights for all citizens on justifiably equal terms. So uh, some support for this view. And I'm not going to be exhaustive here. Uh, what I'm going to do for this and the other two views is provide some evidence from sometime as late as 1868, but no later, that provides historical evidence that somebody interpreting the Privilege or Immunities Clause might use to conclude reasonably that the clause in, uh, instantiates or de declares the meaning that I'm talking about. So, for instance, the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It is agreed by everyone that one of the major intentions of the drafters of the, Civil, uh, of the 14th Amendment was to backfill a sound, irrefutable, uncriticizable constitutional basis for Congress to pass the Civil Rights Act of 1866. There were theories of the Constitution floating around in the 50s and especially toward the end of the Civil, Civil War, according to which the Constitution, before the ratification of the 13th Amendment, gave Congress power to pass something like the Civil Rights Act of 1866. But those were theories, they weren't settled law, and there were problems with them. The 13th Amendment, some thought, also provided a basis for the Civil Rights Act of, 1760, of 1866, but not all uh, people at the time thought that it, the 13th Amendment put the Civil Rights Act on a really firm footing. The 14th Amendment was understood, a, a, among its other functions, to put this act on a firm footing. So according to the Civil Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, among other things, states, and such per all persons and such citizens of every race and color shall have the same right in every state and territory in the United States 
to make and enforce contracts, to sue, to be parties and give evidence, to inherit, to purchase, lease, sell, and hold and convey personal property, and to full and equal benefits of all law and proceedings for the security of person and property as, an, as, an enjo as is enjoyed by uh, white citizens. And a congressman in 1866 supported giving freedmen the rights, privileges, and immunities of other citizens of the United States, whatever those rights may be. Both of these uh, pieces of evidence make, make an argument along the following lines. There are a set, the state law protects a set of rights associated especially with the, saying, the, the, the protection and integrity of person, the rights of property, and the rights of commerce that one needs in order to be able to transact with property or to use one's liberty. However, state laws vary considerably in the way they protect these basic rights of person and property. The federal, a decent respect for federalism requires that the federal government keep more or less out of the choices of individual states to, in how they structure the, those uh, protections for person and property. However, we fought the Civil War in large part because some states were not giving any protection to the persons of slaves and they also were not giving protection to the rights of those slaves since they weren't treated as people, they didn't have rights of property either. So states can structure their, uh, their rights, of uh, their tort law, their criminal law, their commercial law, their property law, how they like, as long as they don't try to write the laws to exclude any of the people, uh, who, any, any groups on the basis of race or ethnicity. And that's, so in short, states have large discretion how to structure their local regulations of person and property, but they can't dis discriminate. The, 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 loss, the norm is an anti-discrimination norm. And the, there are many, uh, there are several uh, Supreme Court opinions embracing this view. The most recent, and I think an excellent inroad into the scholarship and the case law in favor of this review, is an article by John Harrison. It, uh, I have a short site to the page range where he, make, he propounds the anti-discrimination view. The full site is a couple of slides earlier. Now, if the anti-discrimination view were, to, were the law of the land, what would happen? And then I'm going to use here the gun ordinance uh, that was challenged in the McDonald case. So, and I'm going to assume that the right to bear arms is the kind of guarantee of person, or it, it, the right to bear arms is the kind of topic that the 14th Amendment covers. Privileged immunities, when they cover basic fundamental uh, rights of person, one of the rights they cover is the, uh, the right to bear arms and the right to protect oneself using arms. If the anti-discrimination view were to hold, then uh, the city of Chicago, uh, in, that, in McDonald's, the city of Chicago was enforcing an ordinance that allowed city residents to register, it required them to register in order to keep handguns in their homes. Now that ordinance limited the right to keep and bear arms, but under the anti-discrimination view, states and state actors like cities have substantial discretion how to structure the, le the positive laws protecting fundamental rights how they like. And Chicago could, across the board, uh, limit the right to bear arms in a certain way. The anti-discrimination view would only stop Chicago from enforcing this right in a way that gave the right to, that, that gave some people greater free action to use arms without state restraint than others. The Chicago law didn't limit the right limit the right to bear arms on the basis of race or some other justifiable con characteristic. So, if the anti-discrimination view is were the dominant law, Chicago would not have violated the Privileges or Immunities Clause. Now. Here are some other, now the other, more broadly beyond the context of the right to bear arms, the, if the anti-discrimination view were the law of the land, a lot of the work that is now done in contemporary equal protection doctrine would migrate to the privileges or immunities clause. It used to be the case that state or local laws used to bar sales of homes owned by white owners uh, to black buyers. The right to transact real property oops, would constitute a privilege or immunities. And states could, could, could structure their conveyancing laws largely how they like, except they couldn't let some people have greater rights to conveyance than others. They couldn't bar blacks from buying or whites from selling to blacks. So that, the Privileges or Immunities Clause would give Congress jurisdiction to pass a federal law invalidating state or local restraints on conveyancing that are race-based or ethnicity-based, 
and federal courts would have jurisdiction to declare the state or local ordinance is unconstitutional. Next view, the incorporation view. The Privileges or Immunities Clause on this view makes applicable to the states the guarantee that the Bill of Rights makes applicable on the federal government. Uh, to say it makes applicable the Bill of Rights is to say that the Privileges or Immunity Clause incorporates by reference the Bill of Rights. Again, the Bill of Rights applies only to, li it limits uh, actions by the federal government and the st function of the Privileges or Immunities Clause is to say the protections in the Bill of Rights are privileges and immunities and states may not pass laws restraining those in the same manner that Congress may not pass laws restraining them and federal officers that execute or adjudicate federal laws may not construe those laws to violate Bill of Rights guarantees. And there are passages that could be construed to support the incorporation view. Uh, Senator Jacob Howard was a uh, respected member of Congress and he was a an important player in the debates about the, ratification, or the, 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 the adoption of the 14th Amendment by Congress. And he, in one of his floor statements, said, to these privileges and, or, and immunities, whatever they may be, for they are not and cannot be fully defined to, uh, in their entire extent and precise nature, more on that for a minute, to these should be added the personal rights guaranteed and secured by the first eight amendments to the Constitution. So Howard, a leading sponsor of the, privilege of the 14th Amendment, is saying whatever else the, privileges, the 14th Amendment means, the privileges and immunities part of the 14th Amendment is, is bringing in by reference the, uh, the rights declared in the first eight amendments in the Constitution, that is the Bill of Rights Basic Guarantees. Now, what if the, the, bill of, what if the uh, 14th Amendment incorporated the Bill of Rights? And let me start off with McDonald. So then the ordinance in McDonald would be subject to the same substantive limitations as fire, any firearm law passed by Congress. Or, uh, so Congress may not pass laws that, uh, that infringe on the right to bear arms as declared in the Second Amendment. And if the Second Amendment is incorporated by reference in the Privileges or Immunities Clause, then whatever Congress can't do under the Second Amendment, states and state agents may not do under the 14th Amendment. Now, Heller, the, the, the Heller case was decided two years ago, uh, two years before the McDonald case. Heller involved the District of Columbia and not uh, Congress. It was, it was an act by the District of Columbia. However, the Second Amendment applied to the District of Columbia because the District of Columbia's government uh, it, I'm so sure you all know better than I do, is exercising powers vested in it by Congress. Congress gives the D.C. government home rule powers, and the home rule statutes were the one, statutes that provided the statutory authority for D.C. to pass the ordinance challenge in Helen. So if that, so, but in any case, back to Chicago, if the right to bear arms in the Second Amendment is apply, incorporated into the 14th Amendment, then Illinois and Illinois state a actors May not, may not pass laws that restrain the, uh, the right to bear arms as understood in the Second Amendment. So in that case, the right to bear arms, a law that would be problematic if it, it conferred the right to bear arms on some individuals in the state but not others. The, 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 the Second Amendment ha has, among its other restrictions, a, a state's inequality norm. Uh, but separately, the Second Amendment also puts some substantive limitations on the kinds of laws that the, the, um, the, ki the kinds of restrictions that a state may enact in the course of regulating and making reasonable the exercise of the right to bear arms. So you would, one would have to look at the particulars of the handgun registration requirement in the Chicago case and ask whether they restrain the right to bear arms more than is necessary to regulate the right, more than is necessary to make the right to bear arms accord with potential abuses of the right. Uh, say people of, like to take it, uh, like um, as one example, somebody is, is um, somebody who has by a track record uh, committed several crimes using a gun, maybe the, uh, a, a law that takes that person, takes away that person's right to bear arms would be a reasonable restriction. So if the, if the uh, ordinance challenged in the McDonald case couldn't be justified as a reasonable restriction on the right to bear arms, keeping it to its reasonable uh, limits, 
then it, the, the right to bear arms, or that, then, then the ordinance would be invalid. Now, outside of the context of the, the uh, outside of the context of gun rights, there, if the incorporation view were held to be the, the, um, the, the to, to state the, the right understanding of the Privileges or Immunities Clause, Congress would have jurisdiction to pass civil rights laws covering all the other guarantees in the Bill of Rights. So Congress could pass a civil right law declaring freedom of religion, and here Congress would be exercising 14th Amendment power to stop states from restraining privileges or immunities understood as the, uh, the rights of free religious exercise and the right to be free from religious establishment declared in the First Amendment. Similarly, if uh, Congress were to determine that a state law, let's say a state libel law, made it way too easy for uh, individuals in that state to sue people for libel and do way too much to chill free speech, then Congress could deem the state libel amendment to be a privilege or immunity because a privilege or immunity incorporates the uh, free speech guarantees of the First Amendment, and Congress could pass legislation unwinding state libel laws that it's deemed to be inconsistent with the core of free speech. Another one, the, uh, the, the Seventh Amendment guarantees a jury trial for suits of a certain value. If a state were to restrict the access to a jury trial for uh, to a class of cases where traditionally a jury trial had been granted, Congress could decide that the state judicial proceedings uh, were abridging a, a privilege or immunity of U.S. citizenship thanks to the 14th Amendment's uh, codifying and incorporating the Seventh Amendment. And the Fifth Amendment eminent domain clause would again be applicable on states. Now, by contrast, if, the incorporation, if incorporation is the exclusive source of the privilege and immunity clause's meaning, individual rights that don't have any textual pedigree in the Bill of Rights wouldn't be covered by the 14th Amendment. So, for instance, much of what I've called or at the beginning of my talk the substantive due process case law focused for until from, say, 1875 or so through the end of the New Deal, much of that case law focused on the, the extent to which the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause stops states from restraining liberty of contract. And so if states make certain companies undergo rate regulation, the uh, state laws might deny substantive due process. If the, there is no liberty of contract clause in the Bill of Rights, Congress is not limited by a liberty of contract limitation. So if incorporation is the sole and exclusive determinant of the 14th Amendment privilege or immunities clause's meaning, then there's no liberty of contract doctrine. And much of what was in substantive due process about liberty of contract would just got, be gone. Uh, another example would be marriage. Uh, you might say on some readings that, that the anti-discrimination view covers state marriage law. But there's no marriage bill of right, and so there wouldn't be a 14th Amendment bill of uh, privilege or immunity related to marriage. Last view, the fundamental rights view. Now, in, in the CDs that Mercatus provided, uh, I called this in an earlier version of the slide the natural rights view. So there's actually three different uh, placeholders or slogans for this view. One's the natural rights view, one is called the substantial rights view, and the other is the, the fundamental rights view. I, uh, fundamental, uh, I think, on thinking this through a little bit, fundamental captures something that the natural rights view doesn't quite capture. Uh, the, the fun, the, the, and uh, let me just walk through the, the, the restatement of the view and explain why. So as a, at a high level of generality, the fundamental rights view holds as follows. The Privileges or Immunities Clause prevents states from passing laws interfering unjustifiably with natural rights the protection of which is central to Republican government. So the idea of fundamental incorporates two different, very general inquiries. One inquiry is that in the Anglo-American tradition, the right in question is understood by people like Locke, by Blackstone, uh, treatise writers in the United States in the early 19th century, as a natural right of the kind that is declared in the Declaration of Independence and in a lot of early state constitutions. So it's got to be a natural right as understood in the sources. But then it has to be a certain kind of natural right. It's a nat there are some natural rights that are really closely tied up with being a citizen in a Republican government. And other natural rights that is expected many forms of government, Republican and otherwise, protect. And, the, and, and uh, so something, if, 
if a right is a natural right, and it's a right that's customarily been associated with Anglo-American uh, government and Republican government, it's a privilege. But if it's a natural right that isn't, hasn't been pr protected by the Anglo-American legal and political tradition, tradition, and it doesn't seem closely tied with being a citizen in a Republican state, it's a natural right, but it's not a privilege. It's not fundamental enough. So fundamental incorporates that the right has to be understood as a natural right, and it has to be a natural right that's been un respected as a really important right in the Anglo-American political tradition. And I guess maybe independently, third, it has to be a right that thinkers leading up to the Civil War thought was a right that, s that the social compact in, in, in a democratic Republican society thought to be crucial. So there are passages that support, uh, that suggest that the Privileges and Immunities Clause state a fundamental rights view. Uh, recall this, the, in the long passage I had from Senator Jacob Howard, he said privileges or immunities are not and cannot be fully defined in their entire extent and precise nature. Later in that passage, he said that the Bill of Rights guarantees state fundamental or state uh, privileges or immunities. But this passage suggests the Bill of Rights guarantees do not supply the exclusive and exhaustive content of the privileges or immunities clause. There are other rights. And Howard cites as exemplary for what he means by the privileges or immunities uh, an 1823 case called Corfield versus Coriel. In that case, the, th this case was, it was litigated under the privileges and immunities clause in the Fourth Amendment, or the Fourth Article, Section 2 of the original Constitution of 1787. And when Corfield interprets the privileges and immunities clause, uh, the Senator, or, or, sorry, Justice U.S. Supreme Court Ju Justice Bushrod Washington, writing circuit, says that privileges and immunities refer to rights which are in their nature fundamental, uh, which belong of right to the citizens of all free governments, and which have at all times been enjoyed by the citizens of the several states which compose this union from the time of their becoming free, independent, and sovereign. So the, the, this, this passage captures a lot of the general definitions that I talked about earlier. So obviously he uses the phrase fundamental, but then also it's a, it's a right which belongs of right to the citizens of all free governments. When I say earlier that a right is essential to citizenship in Republican government, he, that's what I'm talking, uh, Washington talks about the same, he talks about something that belongs of right to a citizen of a free government, a uh, Republican government, and have at all times been enjoyed by the citizens of the several states um, from the time of their becoming free, independent, and sovereign, that's what I'm getting at by talking about a right that has been protected in a certain way in the Ameri Anglo-American legal tradition. So the rights were protected when the colonies were colonies, and then the, 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 the colonies when they became states continued to protect the rights in a certain way, and the, the states did. So Corfield gives a few examples of such rights, and some of these aren't in court rights in the Bill of Rights. So the right of one citizen of one state to pass through or reside in any other state for purposes of trade to institute and maintain actions in court, to take hold and dispose of property. The most common defender of the uh, fundamental rights view uh, now is Randy Barnett uh, in his book, recent book, Restoring the Lost Constitution. I have some differences with his treatment of the issue, but if I wanted to pick one source that's gone the furthest to develop this view in the last 10 years, Barnett would be my nominee. So how would the fundamental rights view apply to the uh, McDonald litigation. The first thing you'd want to ask is whether uh, the right to bear arms is a natural right fundamental to Republican citizenship. And I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to run over this slide because I think Professor Malcolm is going to talk about this at greater length than I will fare. So let's just assume the answer is yes. Then, uh, so then the, the right to bear arms would be a privilege or immunity. But it wouldn't be so primarily because, or exhaustively because, the, the, the right to bear arms is already in the Second Amendment. Rather, if you look at Anglo-American practice, there, there were lots of instances where the right to bear arms was restrained and political coalitions went ballistic and caused those restrictions to be uh, repudiated. There's case law suggesting that the right is very important. And what the Second Amendment and state constitutions all declare something like a right to bear arms. And all of that evidence together suggests that people from, say, 1760 through 1865 thought this was a right that was pretty darn important. You need to do a little bit more to explain why it's crucial to Republican citizenship, 
Uh, but I think one of the things you could rely on is the fact that the, the uh, right to bear arms is tied with the militia. And or in a, a Republican government, the people is supposed to be the militia. And so the right to bear arms, in order for the people to be self-governing, they have to be able to defend themselves. And they have to organize a militia. And they have to have a right to have their own arms and practice with their own arms to be in the militia. So then, if that were the case, then the right to bear arms at, would... States could not restrain the right to bear arms as it was generally declared and understood in this political tradition. And I think in that tradition then, it would be improper for a state to limit or, or any, any government to limit the right to bear arms on the basis of race, but also there are certain substantive restrictions that states could not pass. There would be certain restrictions that would be reasonable exercises of state police powers and you need to get into inquiries about that. But the right to bear arms would be a privilege, and states would have to justify restraints on the right to bear arms by saying that the right to bear arms was a reasonable regulate, police regulation of the right to bear arms and not an, uh, an impermissible arbitrary abridgment of the right. But there are other implications of the natural rights view, uh, or the, the fundamental rights view. So for instance, Congress would have jurisdiction to pass, uh, pass laws preventing states from restraining most of the Bill of Rights especially guarantees on speech, property, or criminal trials, because all of those rights, they're, they're, they're positive law legal rights declaring and specifying fundamental natural rights to speak freely, to use one's property for one's own ends, and not to be thrown in jail arbitrarily. But some Bill of Rights guarantees might not specify fundamental natural rights. One example, jury trials. Uh, there were, there's mixed evidence about whether uh, the jury trial, right to a jury trial was understood to be a fundamental natural right. Some thought it was, others denied it, and, and there's a debate. Another one is free religious exercise. I think it is unanimously, it's, everybody agrees that at the founding and thereafter, the right to free religious exercise was understood to be a natural right. But I think there, there's some dispute about whether it was a natural right that was essential to citizenship in a Republican government and the, on the ground that religious rights were different in all countries, no matter who they were, had some natural law obligation to respect religion. Now, on the other hand, uh, the, 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 uh, not only would the fundamental rights view run to the, the um, it would cover some, though not all, the Bill of Rights guarantees, but it would also cover some unenumerated rights. So, back to restraining the right to practice a trade. Corfield versus Coriel mentioned this as a basis, as, a, as an example of a fundamental natural right covered in the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And you'd have to look at all other enumerated rights known to be natural and fundamental in the, in the Anglo-American tradition. And I think I'll stop there and pass the baton to Professor Malcolm. And we've, by previous arrangement, are gonna take questions after both of our talks. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Great. Need to be plugged in. Um, very happy to be here today. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the uh, Second Amendment and the way in which the Privileges and Immunities Clause came up in the decision uh, in the McDonald case. Um, the Second Amendment really is the perfect uh, example of an opportunity to see how this Privileges and Immunities Clause uh, works or could work uh, in uh, a decision to incorporate. Uh, it's it's a, the rare amendment that hasn't, or hadn't, I should say, until 2008, had its core meaning really clarified by the Supreme Court. That's not to say that people didn't think that they knew what it meant for years and years and years, but uh, there was a controversy, especially in the lap uh, since the 1960s, and um, many people, because of worries about uh, gun violence, decided that there were other meanings to it than that it was an individual right. Um, and what I'd like to do is to just quickly go over the background of the Second Amendment law and then deal with uh, the Heller case of 2008 and then the McDonald case. Um, but I'd like to start with um, Judge Kosinski, who I love to quote. <laughs> but Kosinski, uh, who sits on the Ninth Circuit, uh, 
um, said this about the Second Amendment in, uh, in a dissent from the rest of the Ninth Circuit at that point, uh, who had declared that the Second Amendment was merely a collective right. Uh, he said, judges know very well how to read the Constitution broadly when they're sympathetic to the right being asserted. But as the panel amply demonstrates, as his colleagues on the bench, when we're none too keen on a particular constitutional guarantee, we can be equally ingenious in bearing the language that it incontrovertibly is incontrovertibly there. It's wrong to use some constitutional provisions as springboards for major social change while treating others like senile relatives to be cooped up in a nursing home till they quit annoying us. And then he says, expanding some gargant to gargantuan proportions while discarding others like crumpled gum wrappers is not faithfully applying the Constitution. Um, until these last few uh, years, until uh, since 2008, the Supreme Court really hadn't taken a serious look. And, and just as a quick example of the gum wrapper status of the Second Amendment, uh, Lawrence Tribe's um, major text on constitutional law, which some of you may have had in law school, first edition of 70, uh, 1979, the Second Amendment was literally a footnote. It was a footnote uh, saying that this isn't really a right. It's just for states to have a militia. Um, ten years later, he brought out the next edition, and the Second Amendment was elevated from its footnote status. It had a few paragraphs. And then finally, in 1999, uh, much to the chagrin of uh, the liberals who had loved the footnote status of the Second Amendment, um, and taking account of the uh, research that had been done, uh, he had something like 10 pages on it and conceded that, well, there did seem to be an individual right here. Uh, so he actually changed his mind, so I give him some credit for it. It takes a big man to change his mind publicly in that way. Um, at any rate, uh, there w the Second Amendment really was a pre-existing right, and that's one of the, the uh, issues that came up in the um, Heller case. The, there was an English version of this right. They had a Bill of Rights, 1689, a century before our Bill of Rights. And in that Bill of Rights, and it's a, a more guarded right, uh, it said that the subjects which are Protestant, who well, I should say were at that point 90% of the population, may have arms for their defense suitable to their condition and as allowed by law. So there were sort of exclusions in that that meant that it was possible, apart from the religious test, as it were, um, to uh, limit the right. But by the time of the American Revolution, the London recorder, who was the legal advisor to the city of London, uh, pointed out that the right of His Majesty's Protestant subjects to have arms for their own defense and to use them for lawful purposes is most clear and undeniable. So th this was the, the, this personal right that, um, that the founders inherited. And I don't want to go into the, um, the evidence on that. I've spent a lot of years calling through this. And, and, uh, and the cases go into it in a very um, impressive way. Um, but at any rate, here was this uh, right put in as this, uh, the second of the, the uh, first 10 amendments. Um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, it has this clause at the start, uh, well-regulated militia being necessary to uh, the security of a free state. And um, as um, Professor Cleese said, there's this connection. Um, you can't have a well-regulated militia or any militia if they can't have arms. And the idea was that people would be uh, not only able to have weapons, but trained in their use. Um, but it also embodied an individual right to self-defense. And while that individual right to self-defense will not be found, unfortunately, in the UN Declaration of Human Rights or the EU Declaration of Human Rights, it was always regarded as the first law of nature, one that uh, was so in, um, important that no government could really take away your right to protect yourself, or any way they shouldn't. Um, the, the, the law was, or the, I should say, the right was understood generally to give people um, this ability to have weapons uh, for themselves. And in fact, um, in the um, infamous Dred Scott case before the Civil War, uh, Justice Taney said that if the, if the, the slaves ha had the rights of citizens, they could, quote, keep and carry guns wherever they went. So this is one of the reasons that he worried about giving them the rights of citizens. In the, if we kind of 
uh, move quickly to the early 20th century, uh, there were real concerns about giving the broad public a right to be armed. In the North, there were thousands of people immigrating from Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, other places. Some of them, when thinking about it, were you know, your traditional anarchist with a bomb in his hand. <laughs> and so there were, there were real concerns about whether these people should have a right to be armed. And that's when New York in 1911 passed the Sullivan Act that really, for the first time, kind of clamped down on who could be armed. In the South, there were fears about blacks being armed, and so some of the um, black codes tried to limit the use of guns um, by African Americans. The first National Firearms Act was in 1934, and it limited automatic weapons, sawed-off shotguns, silencers. These were the weapons that were favorites of uh, the, the gangs, and you know, during Prohibition and other times, you know, submachine guns. And so it was felt that there, you needed some kind of uh, restriction on that kind of weapon. So they were prohibited or strictly monitored. And um, one of the I guess the last time that the Supreme Court, before 2008, actually took a look at the Second Amendment involved that statute of 1934, the National Firearms Act. It's a U.S. Uh, versus Miller case, 1938, tested the constitutionality of that act and whether it, it infringed on the Second Amendment. Um, it's a very strange case, and the people who were for and against the idea of an individual right use that case, and it's so vague that the, either side could use it you know, pretty satisfactorily to themselves. Um, but basically, two men uh, who were kind of shady characters had crossed the state line uh, carrying a sawed-off shotgun and were stopped. And they, their lawyer claimed that this statute that limited their use of a sawed-off shotgun um, uh, violated their Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And this case was taken eventually to Supreme Court. Their lawyer never appeared. Um, so all that they had, all the court had was the other, the government's brief on it. Uh, and it mentioned something about how a sawed-off shotgun didn't seem to have a reasonable re relationship to a well-regulated militia. Um, and this uh, reference to the well-regulated militia and sawed-off shotguns um, meant that the people who those who feel that it's only those members of a militia that should have a right to be armed, seized on that to say, okay, see, you know, uh, it has to, the militia is what it's really all about. And people who argue for the individual rights said, yes, but, you know, a sawed off shotgun. I mean, there are some things that are appropriate. The lawyer didn't appear. The thing was never resolved. It, was a, you know, and they, it wasn't a question whether these two were members of any militia. They surely were not. So it was, a, it left everything kind of murky, and into the 60s, when you have all the worries about gun violence, assassinations, um, restrictions, federal action on controlling guns, um, you have more and more um, concern about the core meaning of the amendment. Uh, the Supreme Court had opportunities to get into that, um, but kind of waived uh, them aside and left it. So it was never really brought to their attention, or they would, I would say they never deigned to look, pay any attention to it, uh, until um, 2008 when uh, the District of Columbia versus Heller came up. Now, some of you may be very familiar with the, um, what was the Washington, D.C. gun ban, and I'd like to just go over that briefly and then the history of that case. Um, although I, I should say that they are doing their best to duplicate that ban, um, and so far it hasn't been thrown out. But at any rate, it was an extraordinarily strict ban on residents having handgun in their homes. It was passed in 1976, and if you had a handgun before 1976, you could keep it. You could have a long gun. The gun had to be disassembled. It had to have a, um, a, a lock on it or some, something else to keep it from being useful. Uh, you were not allowed to take it from one room to another within your own home. You basically had to wait till the person got to you if they broke in. Um, and even then, there was no exception for you putting the gun together to defend yourself. Uh, although during the, ar the oral argument, um, the uh, solicitor general tried to, he kind of 
finessed that issue. I said, oh, well, of course you could have put it together if the guy set your door and put your door. But according to the actual le legislation, you could not put it together to protect yourself. Um, Wash the, what had happened was that a, a, a group of people, um, who uh, activists who, um, and others, got together to bring this case. Uh, at the first level, um, the court, the lower court, found against this being a violation of their Second Amendment rights. Then went to the uh, Court of Appeals and uh, the district, and they found that their Second Amendment rights had been uh, denied to them. It then was up to the city of Washington whether it wanted to take this forward to the Supreme Court or not, because they had a lot to lose if they took it forward. I mean, maybe they could keep that statute, just tweak it a bit. Um, after a certain amount of thought, they decided and, uh, to take it to the court. Um, and the only um, person, one of the petitioner that had, was still standing was Heller, uh, who was a, a security guard, I think, on Capitol Hill, uh, who used a gun during the day, but was not allowed to have a gun at home. Um, one of the other people who was involved in this case was Shirley Parker, a woman who lived in a dangerous part of the city and had uh, been reporting drug deals to the police, and the drug dealers knew where she was, and they threatened to come and get her. And so her reason for wanting a gun was uh, to protect herself in her own home. Um, at, at any rate, oh, I should just point out briefly, because I have some time, if you don't mind, um, that one of the reasons that, the, the, uh, that Mayor Fenty said that they had to take this case forward was that they couldn't stand by and let people die in Washington, D.C. There, Washington, D.C. was the site of a, a horrendous, I think, landmark case, Warren versus District of Columbia, in which, uh, this is from 1981, um, three young women who had a townhouse in Washington um, had their home broken into. There was one roommate who was downstairs, and two men broke in and attacked her, and she was screaming, and her roommates upstairs called 911. They called 911 repeatedly for about an hour. Nobody ever came. They, the screams stopped. They figured maybe the police had come or men had left. They went downstairs only to be all of them attacked by these men who were in their home for 14 hours. The police never, ever show up. So the women sued the city of Washington to supposedly protecting their lives. Washington went to court, um, and the court found in its wisdom that there was no real obligation for the police to protect any individual. And to me, that's your collective right. You have a collective right for protection, but boy, you don't have an individual right. So those women you know, had no um, expectation or that the police were going to come and help them out. So when Fenty said he couldn't stand by and let people die uh, by having guns on the street, it seemed kind of ironic. However, I'm biased on this, as you can obviously tell. Um, at any rate, the, the court heard the case, and it was a narrow decision, five to four, with Scalia writing for the majority. Uh, very close historical analysis. He went carefully through the history. The, 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 it was a pre-existing right, the colonial history, um, carefully parsed every word using uh, 18th and 19th century dictionaries. You know, if you want to read something that was a, you know, a real work, um, that was it. Um, he, uh, he found that they, they found they, were, they had two questions to deal with, whether there was an individual right to be armed or only a collective right, and whether individuals had a right to have a handgun in their home for their self-defense, because uh, the city was saying, well, you could have a long gun. I didn't mention that it had to be disassembled, but you could have that there. We're just, you're just saying you can't have a handgun. And they found that there was an individual right uh, that the Second Amendment incorporated for people to have a gun for self-defense, and that you could have a handgun because that was the weapon that most people preferred for their self-defense. Um, the uh, Stevens and Breyer both wrote dissents. Stevens was the main one. Um, he found that there was no individual right, and he parsed all of the, well, he found that the idea that there was a pre-existing right uh, 
that there was a right of law-abiding, this is, I'm quoting, or that there was a right of law-abiding responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home was an overwrought and novel. And he then looked at the language and found a military meaning for virtually everything, which meant that it, we were just talking about the militia here. He uh, looked at the right of the people, arms, bear arms, keep a bear, um, the reference to the right rather than rights. So you might have a right to bear, but he, also he said that keep and bear was a unitary term, so keep had no separate meaning. And one of the things I liked the best was he, he insisted that if there had been a, mean, a, a right to keep and to bear, it would have been to keep and to bear, not to keep and bear. And as Scalia pointed out, the president takes the oath to preserve and protect the Constitution. It makes not one whit a difference whether he takes an oath to, pre to pre preserve and to protect the Constitution. It's all the same. However, um, Breyer admitted that the Washington gun ban had been uh, unsuccessful in protecting people. There was a study that showed that, that uh, compared to 49 other major cities, um, the, the homicide rate in Washington was worse after the ban than it had been before the ban. And Breyer, to his credit, admits this. He admits that, that you know guns have, do seem to help protect people. Um, but he felt that it was really up to legislatures to decide. It's not up to courts to tell them what to do. So when we're pulling back from <laughs> um, assertion, he, he found that, um, that it didn't matter whether it was kind of problematic that this thing didn't work and people were worse off afterwards. The important thing was that we leave it to the legislature and their wisdom to decide. Um, the majority put into uh, the opinion, and I'm going to repeat this for you from Scalia, a, an exception that would make room for the gun control measures that are out there. And this is where I think most of the cases that are coming along are going to have to really wrestle with. And, and it's thought that he put this in to get Kennedy along. It's absolutely crucial because otherwise, I mean, it was five to four, and Kennedy went with the majority. He's, it reads, nothing in this opinion should be taken to cast doubt on restrictions on possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, as well as laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places, such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. So he's put this exception in to reassure people who feel it's really important that there be restrictions on, on felons and the, and the mentally ill and sensitive places. And these are the areas where cases are already coming along to decide what is a sensitive place, um, people now are felons for doing kind of minor things. Does this mean that Martha Stewart won't ever be able to have a gun? Things like that. Um, so the, the, so the, it, it will produce a lot of um, work for lawyers over the years, I, I'm sure. Um, but the, the interesting thing is, of course, that Washington, as um, Professor Clay Sarek mentioned, is a federal city. Which is interesting because Washington tried to get out of the Second Amendment applying to them by saying that it referred to the security of a free state, and they weren't a state, so clearly it didn't apply. But in fact, they ended up being the only place where it applied, you know, since it was a federal city. And since the, um, the Heller case didn't say anything about corporation, um, the McDonald case, which came along two years later, gave the court this opportunity or challenge to decide whether the Second Amendment was a basic enough a requirement of liberty that um, it should be incorporated to apply to the states and the cities. Now, um, a few words about uh, McDonald, Otis McDonald and the city of Chicago. Otis McDonald is an African American in his 70s who, like Shirley Parker, was sort of known as a against drug dealers and so forth, and had been threatened. So his home had been broken into several times, and he'd applied for um, a gun and was not uh, allowed to have one. Washington's law was a carbon copy of, uh, excuse me, Chicago's law was a carbon copy of the Washington law. And in fact, students of mine who have looked at both texts said that it not only is a, a straight plagiarism, but there's some clauses that don't even really apply properly to Chicago. <laughs> 
but they're just taken directly. You know, they just simply copied the Washington law. And um, so in, in that sense, if the act was, uh, if the Second Amendment was to apply to the states, this was just, just as strict uh, a statute as the one that uh, people in the DC were living with. It had been put in place in 1982. Now where the privileges and immunities issue comes into it is that the people who brought, the, the, the attorneys who brought the Heller case were the same ones who brought the McDonald case. And they thought this was a wonderful opportunity to use privileges and immunities the, to incorporate the Second Amendment. Um, it, um, and they would be correcting two problems. They would be incorporating the Second Amendment and they would be restoring the Privileges and Immunities Clause to its rightful place where the, because of the slaughterhouse cases it had been kind of diverted. Um, so they wrote a brief arguing that the Second Amendment should be incorporated um, using Privileges and Immunities. This was very worrisome to people who simply wanted to see it incorporated and thought that this was a rather risky practice to ask the court to do something it hadn't done in 130, you said, 37? 137. 137 years. Um, if you really want to see this incorporated, is that the route you want to take? Sort of a judgment call on the part of petitioners. The National Rifle Association um, decided that they couldn't, that there was too much at stake, that they sh and so they submitted a brief based on the um, due process clause which is what the court had been using for those 137 years, or well, when it started to incorporate. Um, it was, there was a lot of discussion uh, over the blogs and internet and everything about whether this was wise, not wise. The, the National Rifle Association actually asked for time during oral argument to argue for the standard due process approach to incorporation, and they got it apparently is, is quite unusual. So they had, of course, this was not appreciated by the people arguing on the other side because it was taking time from them. But they had, I think, 10 or 15 minutes to, to present the due process uh, approach to it. Uh, and it's probably um, as well that they did uh, because that's what most of the court um, agreed to. Um, the, the McDonald case uh, makes very interesting reading. There were, and there's a lot of it, five opinions written in the McDonald case. Um, three by the people that were in favor of incorporation and two by dissenters. Um, Justice Stevens, one of the dissenters, wrote what was to be his last opinion and which no one else signed on to. It was his last opinion writing alone for himself. But, um, but the other thing is, and I that going beyond the whole privileges and immunities issue, and I was sort of reading this material for the Second Amendment implications, it's a wonderful example of, do, of incorporation, of the different approaches you could take to incorporation. Um, because each of the, it's not just due process and um, privileges or immunities, but there other judges looked at it in other ways, which I'll go into briefly. Briefly, so if you want to get a sense of the variety of ways that you can or consider what's required for incorporation, that's a very interesting case to look at. Um, and in fact, Alito, writing for himself, Roberts, uh, Scalia, and Kennedy, goes into a history of the way in which the court standards for incorporation kind of move. Um, originally, uh, with incorporation under due process. Um, the right incorporated could be watered down. It didn't have to be the same right at the state level as at the federal level. Um, there was, a, there was um, the idea that they, at, they, one of the questions that the judges asked was whether, quote, any civilized system can be imagined that would not accord the particular protection. And of course, as, as Alita pointed out, I mean, we have a lot of protections that other civilized systems <laughs> might not have, but that was one of the, the standards that they used over the years for incorporation. So it seemed to be, have, have gone through a series of different um, approaches to see whether something needed to be incorporated or not. Um, the, uh, 
after Alita goes through all of this, he then says that the court eventually adopted a policy of what he uh, cites as selective incorporation, by which the due process clause incorporates particular rights contained in the first eight amendments. Um, and then he says the governing standard is whether a particular Bill of Rights protection is fundamental to our nation's particular scheme of ordered liberty and system of justice. So it has to be not just a nice idea or you know, good, good right for everybody to have, but something that's actually fundamental to our system of government. Um, and then he looks at the, um, the history of, uh, of arms and particularly around the, t uh, the, the time of the drafting of the 14th Amendment. Um, he also held that rights um, must be enforced against the states under the 14th Amendment according to the same standards that protect those personal rights against federal encroachment. And um, decides that this idea that there can be watered down rights uh, is wrong as well as the idea that, it, that our rights have to be compared to whether some other civilized country accords them you know, special status or not. But he does, not, uh, he does not buy the Privileges or Immunities Clause. He says the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause incorporates the Second Amendment right recognized in Heller. So he insists on the Due Process Clause. He then, as, a, as kind of a, a gesture to the petitioners, who after all were the ones who brought the case, he says petitioners argue that the Second Amendment right is one of the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. There is no need to reconsider the court's interpretation of the Privileges or Immunities Clause in the Slaughterhouse cases because for many decades the court has analyzed the question whether particular rights are protected against state infringement under the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause. So without really explaining anything other than that, he just says there's no need to reconsider this because for decades we've had this precedent. The other thing that they were worried about, and I think it came out in um, this explanation that you were listening to about privileges or immunities was that the court was really concerned about defining what the privileges or immunities were. That there was, it was uncertain what these privileges or immunities were. And if they went to that standard, would that be opening up a Pandora's box of all kinds of claimed privileges or immunities? So they just sort of stuck to the, this uh, traditional approach. Just, just briefly, um, Justice Ste before I get to Thomas, um, Justice Stevens um, talked about uh, an important tool for guiding judicial discretion on incorporation being sensitivity to the interaction between the intrinsic aspects of liberty and the practical realities of contemporary society. And I should say that Scalia's whole opinion is nothing but a refutation of Stevens' <laughs> opinion. And sort of typical Scalia, but it's very, anyway, Scalia says about this idea that the judges have to have this sensitivity. He said, I cannot say whether that sensitivity will really guide judges because I have no idea what it is. Is it some sixth sense instilled in judges when they ascend to the bench? One hopes, you know. <laughs> or does it mean judges are more constrained when they agonize about the cosmic conflict between liberty and its potentially harmful consequences? Um, and then Stevens goes on to explain that there, uh, there's an aspect of a deeper principle, the need to approach our work with humility and caution. All sounds very good, except that then he goes on to say, a rigid historical methodology is unfaithful to the Constitution's command. That approach is unfaithful to the expansive principle Americans laid down when they ratified the 14th Amendment and the level of generality that they chose when they crafted its language. Um, and then he said it also, if, you look at, if you're looking at the text of the Constitution and you're looking at um, a, a historical basis of what people thought that these things meant, that this would have faced the court's distinctive role in saying what the law is, leaving the development and safekeeping of liberty to majoritarian political processes. And I, I don't have a um, quote from Scalia about how this is the end of democracy if we allow judges to do this. But it is quite um, a powerful uh, comment on this approach that it's, uh, and, he and he spent something like 27 pages of his 
uh, opinion talking about what we mean by liberty, kind of defining liberty, um, and claimed that the liberty preserved in the 14th Amendment is not merely a preservative in nature, but a dynamic concept. And he finds, of course, that the Second Amendment doesn't meet the standard that's necessary for ordered liberty. Uh, and he, he doesn't agree with Heller and uh, feels that it was wrongly decided. Um, Breyer, uh, the other dissenter, uh, who had two of his colleagues um, sign on to his opinion, argued that what you needed was a consensus and that the, before you decided that something should be incorporated and quite ignoring the fact that most states and probably the majority of American people would agree there's an individual right. He simply said there's no consensus here and anyway it would be very disruptive. Uh, now for Thomas, um, Justice Thomas was really very persuaded by the approach uh, of using the Privileges and Immunities Clause. And he wrote a long and very learned opinion, very moving opinion, about the need for the 14th Amendment, what was happening to the newly freed slaves after the Civil War, particularly the disarming them, which came up over and over again in the congressional debates and, um, and was really intrinsic to, um, according, if you look at the historical approach, which Stevens does not want to do, intrinsic to uh, what they were trying to do with the 14th Amendment. They were often disarmed, in fact, by the Southern militia. So if the Second Amendment only pertains to the militia, here's the militia actually disarming a group of people. Um, he also uh, looked, and as he usually does, to what was the most likely public understanding of a particular provision at, at the time that was adopted. Um, one of the, the um, decisions that he cites came from Nunn v. State in 1846, in which uh, the judge found uh, inalienable, that the right to keep and bear arms was an inalienable right which lies at the bottom of every free government. And also pointed out that many people believe that the Bill of Rights actually did apply to the states and were rights that no state should abridge, which I think is interesting because um, both in the early founding discussion of these rights and during the debate over the 14th Amendment, there are those who feel that those, those first eight amendments or 10 amendments actually do apply to the states, even if we haven't, despite um, the uh, decision of courts to the contrary. Um, then, he's, then he talks about uh, the fundamental status uh, whether the Second Amendment has fundamental status. He says, while this court has at times concluded that a right gains fundamental status only at, if it is essential to the American scheme of ordered liberty or deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition, the court has just as often held that a right warrants due process clause protection if it satisfies a far less measurable range of criteria. I should say that um, I've written a piece on this pointing out, well, this all may seem to be academic now, You've got most of the rights in the Bill of Rights uh, incorporated, but there's no end to what could be incorporated if you kind of look up, uh, take a broader nap. And so, um, as, as Thomas says, you know, that, that often this due process clause has uh, used, or the people using it, the courts have uh, had a far less measurable range of criteria. He says, that, then he says, of the due process clause. He says, the notion that a constitutional position that guarantees only process before a person is deprived of life, liberty, or property could define the substance of those rights strains credulity for even the most casual user of words. I mean, if you're just talking about process, that's not the same thing at all. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a procedure. And the fact that lawyers have sort of squeezed these rights in through that uh, and made these you know, years of precedent of it doesn't mean that it, it as he says, it makes any logical sense. Um, so he sums up, um, in my view, the record makes plain that the framers of the Privileges or Immunities Clause and the ratifying era public understood, just as the framers of the Second Amendment did, that the right to keep and bear arms was essential to the preservation of liberty. The record makes equally plain that they deem this right necessary to include in the minimum baseline of federal rights 
that the Privileges and Immunities Clause established in the wake of the war over slavery. And then he says, I agree with the, the court that the Second Amendment is fully applicable to the states. I do so because the right to keep and bear arms is guaranteed by the 14th Amendment as a privilege of American citizenship. So he uses this Privilege and Immunities Clause and finds it a compelling and, and more logical way to look to see whether something ought to be incorporated. And having looked at the history of the Second Amendment as well as of the 14th Amendment, he feels that it should be incorporated, but logically under the privileges and immunities rather than under a process. Um, I'd just like to conclude that um, I'm not sure where things go from here, in case anyone asks, um, whether anyone else will use privileges and immunities, whether I, th I think that Thomas's opinion is a very persuasive opinion, but there's also this worry of how broad privileges and immunities could be. On the other hand, uh, under Stevens's criteria for due process, that seems rather broad as well. So it's difficult to know. It was a risky undertaking um, in a high stakes case to pin everything on privileges and immunities, and I could understand the National Rifle Association and other people being really worried who really simply wanted to see incorporation. Um, but I also think that uh, Thomas wrote a very um, compelling um, opinion on this issue. Uh, as far as the Second Amendment goes, the um, Washington, D.C., as you may know, had, had almost in hand already, when they lost the Heller case, a new version of their ban on handguns. This isn't a ban, um, but they have made it so laborious. I didn't bring the text with me, but I know that you have to go to the police department, I think, four different times. You have two background checks, and I believe that working for the government, you only get one. But you know, getting a gun in DC, you need two. Um, you have to have a, a training course. Um, and they give you a list of trainers. You have to have practice at least an hour on a gun range, but no gun ranges are allowed inside the city, nor are any gun sales allowed inside the city. Um, and then, then the final thing was that there's some kind of initialing of the gun that is a new technology that none of the major gun makers yet do. But in 2011, the Washington, D.C. <laughs> registration will require it of anybody who wants to go through this process. And it took Mr. Heller quite a while to um, meet all these requirements. But, it's, but basically what they've tried to do is make a law that's so difficult. Oh, and the other thing is that I think that, the, um, that your gun registration uh, has a term of only uh, three years, after which you have to register it again. Should you forget to register it again, uh, you are subject to, I think, something like a $1,500 fine and a year in jail. So. Were you not dissuaded by these other problems, um, that little clinker at the end might um, give you pause for thought. Um, Chicago um, has done something not quite as bad, but sort of similar, where if you, have, you can have a gun in the house, but you cannot take it in your garage, you cannot take it in your backyard. Um, you have to go through um, a course and a gun range, and no gun range is allowed. And, you know, so there have been efforts to try to uh, live with this extinguishing of the ban, but by making law that's so stringent that in effect it's meant to do the same thing. So this is where we leave it, and um, I'll, I guess there's, there's time now for questions. Thank you. Movement to challenge the oh sorry, are you aware of any movement to challenge the new laws in Washington D.C. or Chicago is too restrictive, or what do you expect there? I'm not aware of any. I am certain that they will be challenged. The Chicago one is being challenged. I don't know of any Washington uh, challenge, although I would expect that there that there ought to be, especially since it's requiring a technology that's not now available. With the 
two most recent Supreme Court nomination hearings that were held. Uh, was this issue raised, do you know, with, with either the uh, hearings for uh, Justice Sotomayor or Justice Kagan? I think it was, I think questions were asked and not answered. Sort of par for the course these yeah, days. But that <laughs> I, like I, I would, that's, kind of, that's almost the same thing as saying, I'm not positive the sun's probably gonna rise in the east tomorrow, given the way the new nominations are these Great days. Yes, uh, we, uh, uh, for my part, the 14th Amendment has a vesting clause giving Congress power to pass the, uh, legislation appropriate to enforce the provisions of the article. So if Congress wanted to, it could pass a law saying that, uh, declaring, like reiterating that the right to bear arms is a privilege or, or immunity and then stating certain set of criteria to, to, against which to measure state laws to see whether they're reasonable restrictions of the right to bear arms. And it could then institute federal remedies of a one of, a, of many different kinds to, to, uh, to replace. And like, uh, here, the case that provides the most instructive point of contact would be City of Bernie versus Flores. In the city of Bernie and Flores, Congress passed, or the, the, court, the Supreme Court considered the constitutionality of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That statute was passed as a response to and a polite criticism dissent by Congress against the decision of Employment Resources versus Smith, where the court had held that the free exercise, the, the Supreme Court case law applying the free exercise clause should use something should, should uh, not treat with strict scrutiny generally applicable laws that aren't motivated by animus against a particular religion or sect. And the court held in that case that Congress does, it, 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 the court recognized what Section 5 made pretty clear, that Congress does have a power to pass laws enforcing Section 1 of the 14th Amendment and the rest. But the, it had to, in fact, be the case that the court, or that, that Congress is, Congress was targeting things that were wrong under wrongs uh, or state wrongs under Section One, and separately, the court in, imposed a proportionality requirement so that the action by Congress had to be a proportion. The means that Congress employed in its act needed to be a proportional response to the violation of Section One guarantees that that uh, the Congress was protecting against. And there is a lot of fluidity, or there, there's. There's a lot of room for reasonable people to disagree in any particular act. When Congress declares a certain right and then declares how to fix it, there's going to be room to argue about exactly what kind of remedial measures are going to be appropriate. Some would say that what, all you have to do is to give somebody a right of action, like in a Section 1983 suit, they can go to a federal court, and that's the most targeted way to stop uh, violations of rights and you just let the court say what the rights ought to be under the 14th Amendment and if the state violates the rights as construed by the courts is wrong. Or the, then, th or if the, per if the state has violated the right then it's a wrong and the Section 83 suit gives the person a wrong, a, a right of action uh, enjoining future wrongs and a story. But some would say that, that uh, Congress should have a right to pass laws that are uh, like anti-circumvention laws or laws that, and t that, that stake out safe harbors that the state shouldn't do anything on a certain side of the line and to, to, make, it, to make sure that, there are, that states don't do some, that they don't do the absolute minimum to respect the right and dare litigants to, to sue them. And then you get in debates about whether that kind of response is proportional or not. And, much of what Professor Malcolm's talking about in the DC response, if you had a federal statute declaring a right to bear arms that had some kind of anti-circumvention or safe harbor declaration, then you'd have back and forth about whether Congress could pass a law stopping DC from doing the absolute minimum necessary to comply with Heller. We have, uh, you know, 
discussion today about privileges or immunities. Can those coexist? I mean, if we've got changes in the future relative to, you know, case law, um, are they mutually exclusive or it can, can, can they live in the same precedent? I have answers, but you take a step yeah. further. I, I think that some things are strictly process. And, that, you know, I think that, that uh, Justice Thomas was right. And, you know, something that is due, due process means something. Uh, it means a procedure. And so I, I think those things ought to be able to coexist. I think what's the, been the problem is trying to define what privileges or immunities are. And I, you know, and of course there's a, a lot of people working away on that. <laughs> But I, I, I would think that they ought to be able to. I, in a sense, you sort of hope that the privileges and immunities can be um, clarified so that it, it will shoulder some of the, the um, base that it should have. Because I, I mean, obviously it was put in there for a real purpose. It wasn't you know, a, a just an add-on. I mean, there was a lot of debate in the end. Uh, people thought about the privileges and, and or immunities, and their privileges and immunities mentioned in the Constitution, privileges and immunities of citizenship. So I would hope that they could be, um, and each one would be a, in accord with what seems most logically uh, to belong to it. I'm going to answer your question in three different cuts. First one, in my pr capacity as a lawyer pr uh, predicting what the courts are going to do, I think it extremely unlikely that privileges or immunities is going to be a growth area. Um, you, you have Justice Thomas staking out a position that the that substantive due process ought to be limited and supplanted by privileges or immunities. But you, no one else on this court uh, bought that theory. Folks who tend to be let's say, uh, living constitutionalists, they like substantive due process as it is, and Justice Stevens' opinion is, gives you an exemplary opinion by a living constitutionalist. Substantive, they, substantive due process as it is now for them is just fine, and you look to evolving standards of decency and evolving conceptions of liberty to look at every particular right. Fo most of the people who are likely nominees by a Republican administration are more like Scalia or Alito than like Thomas. Thomas is somebody who, in it, give him, force, him, uh, force him to choose between a rule of law that restrains the discretion of courts and the original meaning of the Constitution, he will side with the original meaning of the Constitution. Force him to choose between 130 years of precedent and the original meaning of the Constitution, he will consider the call of precedent, but when push comes to shove, as in McDonald, original meaning trumps precedent. His oath is to uphold, is to support the Constitution, not what judges for 130 years thought the Constitution was if he thinks they got it wrong. So the Scalia's and Alito's, by contrast, they like original meaning interpretation, but in, in a pinch, if a constitutional clause leaves judges with a considerable amount of discretion, they will prefer a construction of the clause that minimizes the discretion of judges. And you can see this in Alito's opinion in McDonald. And you can see it in other areas where this comes up. Another classic example would be the non-delegation doctrine. Article 1 limits Congress from giving, uh, at a very high level of generality, it limits Congress from letting executive officers make decisions that effectively write the rules of legislation. Scalia has stated in a concurring opinion in Mistretta versus the United States, he thinks that doctrine exists and he thinks it has teeth, but it's not one that's justiciable by courts. There's no way the courts can enforce that in a meaningful way. So privileges or immunities for all the reasons Professor Mal Malcolm talked about and you, some, of the ones, some of the tests that I gave you is not a doctrine that is very manageable. You have to ask whether something seems, it, it, assume the fundamental view, rights view is, is, is right. Um, it, it's a, uh, you have to see whether this, the, the, the right states a natural right as Locke and Blackson and Kent and Wilson and Cooley and others would have understood it. There's some ambiguity there. Then is it, is it a right that, that, uh, that seems essentially tied up with a bunch of people forming in a social compact to Republican form of government? That there's, there's a lot of indiscriminacy there. Add that together with concerns about 137 years of water under the bridge. Alito and Scalia and Roberts and people that will not touch this with a 10-foot pole. And 
So then next cut, will, will, like, are there going to be any more Thomases on the court? Unlikely. Uh, Republic, the, President, uh, Republic, uh, uh, Republicans, or, or sorry, Democratic presidents will appoint Sotomayors and Kagans. Republicans are more likely to appoint Roberts and Alitos because they want people who are more reliable on some other issues like the war on terror who are more cautious. So my next answer then is, will, uh, so things are unlikely to change in the courts. But I've seen a lot in the last two or three years to suggest that there are going to be in this Congress next year a lot of people who are asking basic questions about what the Constitution means and wondering why should I be bound to follow a precedent that a judge in another department of the government asked me to do. Uh, so it could be that members of Congress decide the 14th Amendment is focused on, it, it's, it, it's, it gives Congress power to make take actions to prevent state infringements, and members of Congress are, they must respect court precedent, especially in the cases in which those precedents are held, but they're not as bound by it as much. And I could see things changing on that score. Now, whether the courts would take this lying down is a separate question, but. What else? Switch here. Um, Professor Clay seemed to be interested in asking you some questions. No, I was I was more interested. In, no, it was more. I was interested in hearing what people think of the like. What do you associate with the privileges or immunities? I guess one question I had is: Is are you hearing more about guns or about the privileges or immunities clause? <laughs> and to the extent it's the latter, I mean, what do you all associate with the privileges or immunities clause? I mean, for a lot of people, it is a dead letter. Mm -hmm. um, so there are these, these issues now with um, Jane Marriage. Yes. And is marriage a fundamental right? And how would how would a termist or something like that be that's I I have wondered about gay marriage along these lines too. Federal officers are going to get, or I guess first cut, to, for the most part, states are left to make their own marriage laws. The federal government, as I'm sure people here are more familiar than I am, has, response, has, has primary jurisdiction to institute marriage laws for, area, for territories over which it has, has federal jurisdiction. And in a lesser capacity, Congress has some leeway, though the scholars debate about this, to institute rules of the road when there arise disputes about the validity of a marriage or, or divorce. When well, somebody gets married in one state, tries to go to another state, demand the rights of a married person. Uh, rules of Congress under case, and I think it's probably right to say, based on the text of the Constitution, Congress has jurisdiction to, to uh, set some rules of the road about how one state, to what extent one state gives full faith and credit to judgments relating to marriage in another state. So that, but a lot of it, that, that still leaves a lot for states to do. Now, if privileges or immunities under the 14th Amendment were to cover anti-discrimination, then it wouldn't, you then have to, like doctrinally what you'd want to know is whether homosexuality states a group or a classification on a par with race. Everybody agrees that the 14th Amendment had to cover race, but there's, there would be play in the, there, there'd be a new issue that would have to be argued about legally and politically about whether homosexuality would uh, count on the par with that. And all, similarly, you would, uh, if you took a fundamental rights view, then you'd have to ask questions about whether the right to marry is natural, whether the civil laws securing in positive law the right to marriage are fundamental to membership in Republican society. And then you'd have to ask whether the natural law, natural rights tradition, and the historical Anglo-American practices hardwire a certain conception of marriage into place. And there's a bad and there's a good to this. The bad is People in courts and people in uh, partisans who go to legislatures could beat each other's brains out arguing about this and not come to much resolution. I mean, people, some could say, 
uh, homosexuality was strongly discouraged, let's say, in the 1850s and 1860s when this amendment was passed, so it just can't be another class. And others could say, this is an open-ended, like the tests here are open-ended, and this uh, homosexuality ought to be able to move in. And you, uh, same thing about the standards for eligibility to marriage. Like, could, could marriage be locked in to a certain conception, like a man and a woman, or are the, the, the conceptions of ordered liberty, the principles about the, the, the principles fundamental to membership in free society open enough that they could change. Uh, the good about this though, like even as fractious, even as indeterminate as all that is, and even as fractious as it is, uh, the, it, it would be, there's an advantage to having partisans fight about this and having Congress force a settlement that everybody has argued about and come to some resolution. Um, there are some, there are goods about having this work through the court process, but there's a bad to having it go through the court process that a bunch of different judges, one judge in Washington says, Defense, the, the uh, Defense of Marriage Act uh, is perfectly constitutional, another judge says it's unconstitutional, and then a bunch of judges do this, and then a, the court institutes this. So, on, it, there are, the tests are open-ended enough that people could couch their arguments in them. Uh, I, the, the, I think, like with gay marriage in particular, there's a lot of historical evidence tending to cut against the uh, suggestion that gay marriage would be a privilege. But I don't want to say that there's so much evidence that it's a slam, slam the door open and shut, no questions asked case.